Greetings and welcome back to room 303 AP English, the Roberts Lectures. We are in the poetic section and we are now working with the great Thomas Hardy and his The Ruined Maid. Now, of course, Hardy is one of those central poets and writers for us in 303 at LearnStrong.net. We've already given lectures on Darkling Thrush as well as Are You Digging on My Grave, one of the darkest satiric poems that we read in 303. We also, of course, have already dealt with in Roberts The Man He Killed, and later we're going to see the work box. We, we see a number of Hardy's poems and now to the ruined maid, his uh, 1866 offering. Now, just to remind ourselves, Hardy, 1840 to uh, 1928, English novelist most significantly and then obviously poet as well. Let's just put it in our notes one more time and we can't ever get tired of saying this. Hardy is just really brilliant with satire and we're going to see this here as Hardy is going to in many ways attack the notions of conventional moral judgments and we're going to see this in this in this uh, poem. Um, we're going to listen to uh, this poem actually perform for us a, a YouTube presentation um, that you'll be listening to, not watching, but listening to as we read it to get a sense of the two speakers. So let's say really quickly three things about this poem. One, there will be two speakers, two women. They both were on the farm working together and now the quote unquote ruined maid, the one who has gone on to somehow become emancipated from the farm, maybe through some kind of sexual activity where she has lost certain kinds of, you know, virginal purities or whatever. Um, maybe she's been ruined in a number of other ways. We'll get to, you know, how we define that here, here in a bit. Uh, and they're discoursing, okay? Now, we're going to have one speak and then the other respond, and the other responding will be at the end of each of the stanzas, as, as you will see. Number two, let's pay attention to the ways in which dialect is used, and we know this about Hardy, we've mentioned this before, he loves to use dialect to show the differences between social class, and in fact, many have argued that The Ruined Maid is actually a poem about language and about language acquisition. For those of you who know about um, um, the ideas that are presented in the play, uh, My Fair Lady, um, you know, that, that whole notion of uh, how language is an important part of understanding the ways that people differentiate themselves. We're going to see that finally. We're going to pay attention to the ideas of the word ruined. And what does ruined mean? Meant to be taken, obviously, as both negative as well as clearly positive. So we're going to see both of those happening here. All right, let's go ahead now. We'll just listen to the performance, and then we'll come back to, uh, to annotate. in tatters, without shoes or socks, tired of digging potatoes and splitting up ducks. And now you gay braces and bright feathers three. Yes. That's how we dress when we're ruined, said she. I own in the Barton, you said thee and thou and the coon and the soon and t'other. But now you're talking quite fitzy for our company. Some polish is gained with one's ruin, said she. Your hands are like Paul's then, your face blue and bleak. But now I'm bewitched by your delicate cheek and your little gloves fit as on any lady. We never do work when we're ruined, said she. You used to call home life a dream. You'd sorry and you'd suck. But at present you seem to know not of negrims or melancholy. True. One's pretty lively when one's ruined, said she. I wish I had feathers, a fine sweeping gown, and a delicate face I could strut about town. My dear, a raw country girl such as you be, cannot quite expect that. You ain't ruined, said she. Now there's been a lot of debate about how this poem is to be read and more particularly how Thomas Hardy wrote this poem. Notice that we begin with the first of the two ladies, the one off the farm now, 
treating the other girl as somehow lesser because she's been ruined. Notice by the end of the poem, it's the girl off the farm who is saying, I wish I had what you had. In other words, there is a sense of maybe some jealousy there that materializes by the end of the exchange, making this poem even more remarkably brilliant. Also, this poem has been labeled as a poem in education. The way that when one is educated, one will change. I mean, I, I mentioned My Fair Lady or the play Pygmalion is a classic example of this. The way that language is an indicator of the ways people can change over time, especially because of education. Of course, at 2A, well, the major messages here are we often write, don't really understand others. We assume things about them. And, of course, we like to jump to conclusions. And those conclusions are often deeply flawed. Obviously, at 2A as well for messages, conventional moral judgments can be obviously ludicrous and senseless and dumb. There's no real sense in the poem particularly what the word ruined means, but let's jump now to 2B and talk about the brilliant satire here. Obviously, ruined can mean within Victorian culture, ruined can mean that one has lost one's virginity, that is to say, no longer prized anymore within a patriarchal society. But notice how the word ruin gets a secondary meaning here. In other words, my life is going amazing. I mean, I get great clothes. I get, you know, I'm, I speak of, uh, like I'm a, of, of a different class now. And obviously, I'm a different person because of my ruining, whatever that would be, one's education, whatever that would be, sexual or otherwise, right? The satire, of course, is brilliant then in that regard. Notice the dialogue as well it to be, the dialogue or exchange type. To that degree, Hardy is, re is reckoning all the way back to the ancient uh, uh, Platonic dialogues as well. Now, 3A, obviously, we've mentioned, you know, we've mentioned Pygmalion, we've mentioned My Fair Lady, obviously the Hardy poems, especially Are You Digging on My Grave, where you have a very interesting kind of also exchange that's darkly satiric. Let's also put in our notes at 3B, though, Browning's dramatic monologues. We've given a cut, we've given lectures on several of them. My Last Duchess, Prophyra's Lover comes to mind. That is to say, the ability to, to, to share a certain kind of linguistic surprise through satire, and obviously Hardy is one of the very best. Finally, at 3B, what was the time, I mean, I've had students that say, it's so interesting because this is like something that you would see um, at, at high school or on a college campus, where you're trying to put someone in their place and they turn around and put it right back on you, and then you find yourself saying, hmm, maybe your situation isn't as bad as I, as I had thought, or the jealousy got the better of me. What was the time in your life when you went against social conventions and you took heat for it, when was the last time that you were on the other side and you were maybe like trying to talk to someone? I mean, um, a couple of students who, for example, uh, were in an altercation after they read this poem, they, they pointed about, you know, how very quickly insults happen. And especially often you can insult um, the, the, the sexual status, we will say, of maybe someone um, but what if that individual does not take that as an insult, but rather as a mantle of pride? Then all of a sudden, what happens? Well, it's an, it's an interesting turnaround. The genius of Hardy, especially at the psychological and sociological reading of the poem, is quite remarkable. Well, once again, we'll celebrate Thomas Hardy. What a genius. Thank you.